Now, I am joined by a man called Roger Mosey, who I know well from my time at the BBC. Um, uh, but we're not going to endlessly talk about what you and I know at the BBC. I want to, do, I want to know what you know at the BBC. You've got a new book out, uh, your memoir, effectively, of your 33 years, was it, at the BBC? Yes, yeah, it was 33 years. years from Radio Lincolnshire to the Olympics and a bit yeah, beyond that. Yeah, That's a journey and a half. Um, your book is called Getting Out Alive. Um, is that how you see it? No, I mean the, the 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 title was a little bit of a joke. Uh, my my cousin said to me, "It sounds like you've been held by the Khmer Rouge for twenty years," and that was not the way it felt. I'm enormously fond of the BBC. I had a great time there. Um, I think it's a wonderful organisation. But it was a a tough time, and and particularly what what started me thinking about writing a book was the contrast in 2012 between the Olympics and the massive success everybody thought that was, and then going straight away into the horrors of the Savile crisis and the unfolding of the evil of Jimmy Savile. One of its so the, darkest the hours, really. Yeah, that's right, and the management contrast. And uh, strangely, this has happened before, really, in a slightly lesser way in the BBC, where in 2008 we did the Beijing Olympics, which were again seen as a big triumph, and then about six weeks later we had the Ross Brand Affair. So the corporate reputation soars up and then crashes down and I try to write something really explaining what it's like when you're in there and that's happening. And for people who might not know some of the jobs you held in that 33-year career, amongst others, um, editor of the Today programme, controller of my old stomping ground, Five Live, head of television news, director of Olympic and Paralympic coverage, you mentioned, um, and, of course, you did see close-up and personal, the fallout from the Savile affair. Um, it, how does it feel to be out Oh, it feels... I'm, I'm now head of a college in Cambridge, Selwyn College, Cambridge, and I absolutely love it. I love being in an academic institution. I love the students. Um, I think the freedom, the ability to think that you get when you're not doing a huge managerial job Particularly is Particularly daily wonderful. news, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's also another reason for the title, really, in the sense that you can, if you make the change at the right time in your life, find something else that gives you huge energy and fun, which I'm very lucky to have done. And just before we talk more about what's in the book. This news I just mentioned a few moments ago, the BBC um, losing control of the rights to the Olympic Games from 2022 onwards. I mean, this is a, a continuing theme, really, isn't it, for the BBC and sports rights? Yes, it's deeply sad because the point in 2012 was we felt like we owned the Olympics in the BBC on every platform. So we had the TV and the radio and the 24 streams and the online and the mobile. So this is going to be really quite a big change. I very much hope, I mean, it's important to say that, as I understand it, the BBC will be able to bid for the sub-licence for the rights to broadcast some of the Olympics, so it's not necessarily going to be completely lost to the BBC. But this is the kind of challenge now that once the big pay operators get into the market and Discovery is a huge American conglomerate, it's incredibly hard for free-to-air broadcasters in the UK to compete with that. And, and does it tell us that inevitably the BBC is going to shrink? Well, I don't know about that. I think that the BBC has actually done very well in the last five years with a licence fee freeze. And in a time of austerity, you might have said in 2010, the BBC five years on would be a shrunken, emaciated organisation. And actually, it's tremendously strong and on very good form. And it owns a lot of the radio and TV market. It's lead over ITV is bigger than it ever was. But the challenges ahead are significant. And I think particularly with sport, where... In sport, I don't think you can just give the BBC a massively greater licence fee to spend on sport because if you look at what the Premier League went for, and I think we're now talking, is it 12 or £13 million pounds for some matches, uh, a licence fee broadcaster or ITV or Channel 4 can never compete with those sums. So sport is a particularly superheated, supercharged part of the market. And with Wimbledon going on at the moment and the coverage, the BBC's coverage of Wimbledon radio, television, online is absolutely superb. But again... It, Jewel in the Crown? Oh, yes. And I quote in the book that Mark Thompson said, the Director General said to me at one point, that if the BBC lost Wimbledon, it would be like the Ravens leaving the Tower of London. <laughs> and I think though those big events, which are iconic for Britain and for public service broadcasting, are incredibly important for the BBC. What I think is crucial is that getting this content on free-to-air television really matters. So there's some argument that says... 
who ultimately owns it isn't really quite the point. The real thing is, imagine 2012 behind a pay barrier. Imagine that you had to pay your £20 a month to get the Olympics as opposed to being free to air. And that's the critical thing. So I hope John Whittingdale and the government will look very hard still at the listed events list, the events guaranteed free to air, and make sure that the big events stay free to air. John Whittingdale, new culture secretary, former chair of culture, uh, that's right. select committee, media and uh, uh, culture, media and sports select committee. Um, tell me about bias because it's something that he has had his mind on for a long time. BBC bias, go on. I mean, I've, I felt on a daily basis like I was beaten around the head with a stick to make sure I wasn't biased, and that's no bad thing. No, that's um, true. But you've revealed in the book that you think there is a kind of lefty liberal bias in the BBC. What I did, the BBC itself, so a BBC Trust report in 2013 and some other BBC comments, have said that in retrospect, and with the virtue of hindsight, the BBC didn't cover immigration as well as it could in the 2000s, and and it didn't have as many voices as it should have done early enough. In the same way that politicians didn't listen to voters. About yes, that's right. So, so it wasn't necessarily a BBC wickedness that it didn't do it. It was simply that the BBC didn't also have enough voices on urging withdrawal from the EU. And UKIP came up and a, a slightly surprised the BBC and all the other broadcasters. So I couldn't write a book about my time in today five live television news without addressing what I think was going on there and I think that there was there is in the BBC a very natural instinct to have um, anti-racism policies and equality policies and do the right thing internally which I completely support the problem then is when you go into the outside world and talk to some white communities that feel threatened by immigrants I think sometimes we didn't always put those voices on television in the way we should. Because discomfort isn't the same as racism is it? No, no that's right and I think sometimes you, you have to allow people, I mean everybody pays the licence fee in Britain, white working class audiences pay the licence fee as much as middle class Primrose Hill audiences and they've got to see and hear themselves on television. It's interesting in the, um, in the reading of some of the reviews of your book um, I, I, I was expecting the bias bit to be a kind of bit of retrospective whistleblowing, but it isn't, is it? It's a reflection on how you navigate those waters, really. Yes, and, and the point I make, some people have seized on this as me saying that there's party political bias, which I don't. I categorically say I have never cr come across anybody pushing a Labour, Conservative, Lib Dem, UKIP agenda. Um, and I think people also want to seize on this as being the BBC's rotten to its core. And I absolutely don't think that. I'm a massive supporter of the BBC, but I think editorially, each day, it's got to look at its agenda, challenge it and test it that it's getting the impartiality right. Which is an endless job, isn't it? And, it ne is. and needs to feel a little endless. and needs to feel like you're being challenged every sentence. It is, and sometimes you need to attack in an interview from the left as well as from the right. And I, I tell the story in the book that Michael Howard, when he was Home Secretary, was used to the BBC asking questions about civil liberties and isn't it a bit hard sending people to prison all the time. It was a much tougher interview with Michael Howard to say, look, you voted for capital punishment a long time ago. Why didn't you bring that back? Because that's what a lot of people in this country want. And I think sometimes if I listen to LBC and some other stations, I think they can sometimes have that slightly wider breadth of voice than you occasionally get on the BBC. I, well, as a, as a newbie here, I've very much noticed noticed that without having to ask you get a huge breadth of calls from people. Just a final question to you or a thought from you. Uh, Gordon Brown offered you a job or sort of toyed with the idea of getting you on as Charlie Whelan's so his special advisor. I know you gave it serious thought and then eventually said no. Um, what word of advice would you have given him if you were if you were his spad, his special advisor? Oh gosh, I, I, I'm just very pleased. <laughs> Smile I wasn't. Less. I've, I've, I've always had very nice experiences with Gordon, but I think that being his spin doctor would have been the thing for which I was least qualified. It was the right decision, was it? It certainly was. Well, listen, it's a, it's a really interesting read. I've I've read it professionally. Now I'm going to go away and read it personally, if you see what I mean. I've read it with a with a pen in my hand. But thank you very much, Roger, for coming in and talking about it. Roger Mosey, uh, Getting Out Alive uh, is his memoir of life at the BBC. Many thanks for coming in to talk to us.